Well, good morning, West London Alliance Church. My name is David Smith. It's my privilege to welcome you here to our service this morning. We're glad you've decided to come and worship our great God together here today. There's a virtual connection card in the seat pocket in front of you if you are visiting or a newcomer and want to learn a little bit more about the church here at West London. And so you can scan some of those QR codes found on that card, and that'll bring you to various uh, forms that you can fill out. And we'd love to get back to you with some of the ministries and events we have here at the church. The best way to stay in touch with the church and what's happening here is through our weekly email. You can scan that QR code, and every Wednesday morning, you'll get an email with the latest happenings of what's coming up uh, in events and uh, ministry opportunities. So you definitely want to sign up for the weekly email. Uh, we have a few announcements here this morning. Tonight, we have a members meeting at 6 p.m. Uh, for members and associates. It'll be happening here in the sanctuary. At this meeting, Pastor Graham will share on leadership development plans here at WLA. Pastor Jude will be speaking on authority, and there will be some ministry updates as, as well. So if you are a member or an associate, please plan on coming tonight for the members meeting at 6 p.m. here in the sanctuary. We have a baby dedication service coming up on June 23rd during the 11 a.m. service. And if you are a member and wish to publicly dedicate your child to the Lord, please contact Judith Gaunt by Tuesday, June 11th. Speaking of babies, we have the joy of announcing the safe arrival of Callum Theodore Cameron, born to Kyle and Sarah on June 4, weighing eight pounds, three ounces. So let's praise God together for Callum. That's it for announcements this morning. Before we hear the call to worship as is customary here, we'll take a few moments in silence to pray, and to, prepare, to prepare our hearts to worship our great God. So let's do that now. And as you are able, I'll invite you to stand for the call to worship this morning, which is taken from Psalm 57, verses 7 to 11, which says, My heart is steadfast, O God, my heart is steadfast. I will sing and make melody. Awake, my glory, awake, O harp and lyre. I will awake the dawn. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. For your steadfast love is great to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Church family, let's together praise God for his faithfulness, for his steadfast love, for none compare to him. Let's lift our voices together. We'll sing to the one whose kingdom shall reign over all the earth. Let's sing together. Blessing, honor, glory, and power be unto the ancient of days. From every nation, all of creation, bow before the ancient of days. Every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory. Every knee shall bow at your you will be exalted, O oh God, and your kingdom shall not pass away, O oh, ancient of days. 
shall reign. Your kingdom shall reign over all the earth. Sing to the ancients of days. None shall compare to your matchless worth. Sing to the ancients of days. We'll sing that again. Sing to the ancient home days. None can compare to your matchless word. Sing to the ancient home days. Every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory. Every knee shall bow at your throne. In worship you will be exalted, O oh God. Shall not pass away, O oh, ancient of days. O oh, ancient of days. O oh, the ancient of days. We'll sing a familiar hymn now, but one of our uh, brothers in the congregation here has actually contributed some lyrics uh, that are based on Psalm 89, which is the focus of uh, the sermon here this morning. So we'll sing together of God's faithfulness, singing, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Great is thy faith. 
faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. our hope in life and death Christ alone Christ alone what is our only confidence that our souls to him belong who holds our days within his hand what comes apart from his command and what will to the end the love of Christ in which we stand oh sing hallelujah our hope springs eternal oh sing hallelujah now whenever we confess 
Christ our hope in life and death. What truth can calm the troubled soul? God is good, God is good. Where is his grace and goodness known? In our great redeemer's blood, who holds our faith when fears arise, who stands above the storm and trial, who sends the waves that bring us nigh unto the shore, the rock of Christ. Oh, sing. sin. Christ, he lives. Christ, he lives. And what reward will heaven bring? Everlasting life with him. There we will rise to meet the Lord. Then sin and death will be destroyed. We will feast in endless joy. When Christ is ours forevermore, oh, sing hallelujah, our hope springs eternal, oh, sing hallelujah, now and ever we confess, Christ our hope and life and death. Sing hallelujah, our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah, now and ever we confess. Christ, our hope in life and death, now and ever we confess. Christ, our hope. I'll ask the kids to come up and join me on the steps for catechism. Now, kids, as you find your spot, I know that a lot of your mothers are away on the retreat. And I got to say, dads, you did a good job. You got them here. They look good. Awesome. Kids, we have sort of a special question today. It's the question probably, well, I think it's the question with the longest answer. And this question comes with a challenge from me. And we haven't done this challenge in a couple years, so I think a lot of you will be, this will be your first opportunity to do it. But let's look at the question first. The question is, what do we believe by true faith? And so we've talked about putting our faith in Jesus, and this uh, answer to this question answers what true faith is. Now, the answer to this question is the Apostles' Creed, right? That's a special name for this answer, and people have been reciting and learning the Apostle, uh, Apostles' Creed for almost 2,000 years. And here is the answer to the question, what do we believe by true faith? We believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. 
He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. For there he will come to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Now that's a long answer to a question, isn't it? Kids, here's the challenge. I want to challenge you to memorize the Apostles' Creed. And at the end of July, that gives you seven weeks or so, if your parents videotape you reciting the Apostles' Creed and send it to me, I will have a reward for you. So end of July, that's seven weeks to memorize the Apostles' Creed. Now, parents, that means there's some work for you. I understand that. But if you will videotape your kids reciting the Apostles' Creed, I have a reward for them. Now, parents of kids who are at the younger uh, spectrum, the younger age uh, of this group up here, I have very reasonable standards of what I will accept. And so if you want to get a bit creative with that, that's perfectly acceptable. But kids, I'm going to remind you for the next seven weeks about this challenge, and I hope some of you will memorize the Apostles' Creed. I also remember last time we did this, we had a couple seniors memorize the Apostles' Creed. I'd love to see those. I don't promise that I'll reward you, but that would be great. And I even think, uh, Rob, did you do this in Greek? Or was that the Ten Commandments? Yeah, so we had one of our elders uh, gave us the Apostles' Creed in Greek. So that was awesome too. So if you want to do something like that, adults, send that video in as well. All right, kids, uh, we want to pray for you that you have a wonderful time in your classes. Congregation, join with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these kids. They are a blessing to this church. They're a blessing to their families. We would ask, Father God, that you, by your spirit, would help them today as they go to their class to learn of you. That your Holy Spirit would help their teachers and their leaders to communicate your truth and your love to them. Father God, we pray that you would draw each one of them to yourself through your son. We pray you'd watch over them today and the rest of this week. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right, kids, have a wonderful time in your classes. As the kids are making their way out, I'll remind our congregation and perhaps inform anyone new that during the course of the service, we do not take up tithes and offering. Uh, most of our people now are doing that digitally or online. And so if you're interested in that, please contact the church office or go to our website, or you can get the information off the connection card uh, that's already been uh, indicated to you in the announcements. Uh, if you brought something with you today, of course, there is a small box at the back of the sanctuary. You can deposit it there. We continue to give thanks to God for his provision for this congregation and this church. And we continue to give uh, thanks to God for your faithfulness and caring for the church in that way. Uh, in just a moment, uh, Jordan Teeple will come up for the public reading of God's word. Before he does that, I'll invite Barry Usher up uh, to lead us to the Lord in prayer. Let's join together in prayer. Gracious Father, we praise you. As Psalm 9 says, we will give thanks to you with our whole hearts and recount your wonderful deeds. And Father, as we've already sung, you are the one who holds our days in your hands, and you are sovereign over all creation. And as we lift our praise to you now through our prayer, I pray that you would make our hearts glad and help us to exalt in you and sing praise to your name almost high. Father, help us also to humble ourselves before you as we confess our sin and ask your forgiveness. Psalm 9 also says that the nations have sunk in the pit they made. They have been ensnared in the net they hid for others. And we confess that we too have fallen into the traps of our own making and are often ensnared by our own sin and rebellion against you. Father, in these next quiet moments as we confess our sin and seek your forgiveness, help us to abandon all efforts at self-salvation and entrust ourselves to Jesus Christ alone and the sufficiency of his death in our place. Congregation, take a few moments in confession and repentance.
Father, help us to turn away from wickedness and to walk in the path of your righteousness. And as you've forgiven us through Christ, help us to exercise often the costly discipline of forgiving uh, forgiving others as we take up the message of reconciliation and implore others to be reconciled to you. And Father, your word says that you are a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble, and you have not forsaken those who seek you. And thank you for the, this assurance and the confidence it brings as we lay our requests at your feet. And to that end, I lift up to you, my brothers and sisters here who are facing confusing, discouraging situations in their lives that may be causing them to become faint of heart. Would you help them to grow in their ability to pray faithful prayers of lament during this time and bring strength and hope to their hearts through the abiding presence of your spirit? And Father, again, for our congregation, I thank you for your continued financial provision and the different ways that you use to meet our needs. In return, would you help us to obey your command to give regularly and generously and cheerfully, recognizing the blessings you've given us And may our giving flow from faith in you as our sovereign provider as we continue to trust in you for the provision of all of our needs. Father, we also lift up our brothers and sisters at Redemption Bible Chapel, and particularly one of their elders, Rod, who is struggling with his health following surgery. Father, would you heal him? And as he and his family wait on you, make them steadfast in their faith. Comfort them with your presence. And Father, for our missionaries, Matt and Connie, and their daughters, Quinn and Emma, help them as they serve in Southeast Asia. And particularly, we join them in prayer for the healing of one woman who is quite dear to them and has been sick for several months. We ask that you would heal her and that continued opportunities would arise to share the gospel with her. And Father, as we continue in our worship now, Through hearing your word read and preached, open our ears to hear and our minds to understand and our hearts to accept and apply the message you have for us today. Help us to submit to your word and be transformed by your truth through the powerful working of your spirit in us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Um, Our scripture reading today will be Psalm 89. Psalm 89, a mascal of Ethan the Ezraite. I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. With my mouth, I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. For I said, steadfast love will build up forever, will be built up forever. In your heavens, you will establish your faithfulness. You have said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my my servant. I will establish your offspring forever and build your throne for all generations. Selah. Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord? a God greatly to be feared in the council of the holy ones, and awesome above all who are around him. O Lord, God of hosts, who is mighty as you are, O Lord, with your faithfulness all around you. You rule the raging of the sea. When the waves rise, you still them. You crushed Rahab like a carcass. You scattered your enemies with your mighty arm. The heavens are yours. The earth also is yours. The world and all that is in it, you have founded them. The north and the south, you have created them. Tabor and Hermon, joyously praise your name. You have a mighty arm, strong is your hand, high your right hand. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. Blessed are the people who know the festival shout, who walk, O Lord, in the light of your face, who exalt your name all the day, and in your righteousness are exalted. For you are the glory of their strength. By your favor, our horn is exalted. Our shield belongs to the Lord, our King to the Holy One of Israel. Of old you spoke in a vision to to your godly one and said, I have granted help 
to the to one who is mighty i have exalted one chosen from the people i have found david my servant with my holy oil i have anointed him so that my hand shall be established with him my arm also shall strengthen him the enemy shall not outwit him the wicked shall not humble him i will crush his foes before him and strike down those who hate him my faithfulness and steadfast love shall be with him in my name and in my name shall his horn be exalted i will see his hand on the sea and his right hand on the waters he shall cry to me you are my father my god and the rock of my salvation and i will make him the firstborn the highest of the kings of the earth my steadfast love i will keep for him forever and my covenant will stand firm for him i will establish his offspring forever and his throne as the days of the heavens in his uh, if his children forsake the law and do not walk according to my rules if they violate my statutes and do not keep my commandments then i will punish their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes but i will not remove from him my steadfast love or be false to my faithfulness i will not violate my covenant or alter the words that went forth from my lips once for all i have sworn by my holiness i will not lie to david his offspring shall endure forever his throne as long as the sun before me like the moon it is established forever a faithful witness in the skies sela but now you have cast off and rejected you are full of wrath against your anointed you have renounced the covenant of, with your servant you have defiled his crown in the dust you have breached all his walls you have lain his str- strongholds in ruins all who pass by plunder him he has become the scorn of his neighbors you have exalted the right hand of his foes you have made all his enemies rejoice you have also turned back the edge of his sword and you have not made him stand in battle you have made his splendor to cease and cast his throne to the ground you have cut short the days of his youth and covered him with shame sela how long o lord will you hide your will you hide yourself forever how long will your wrath burn like fire remember how short my time is for what vanity you have created all the children of man what man can live and never see death who can deliver his soul from the power of sheol sela lord where is your steadfast love of old which by faith by your faithfulness you swore to david remember o lord how your servants are mocked how i bear in my heart the insults of of all the many nations with which your enemies mock o lord with which they mock the footsteps of your anointed blessed be the lord forever amen and amen this is the word of the lord This morning we continue in our summer sermon series in the Psalms that was started last week today looking at Psalm 89. Remarkably, uh, at least one third of the entire book of Psalms, which is known as Israel's praise book, Israel's worship book, Israel's prayer book, consists of laments that express deep emotional distress and sorrow and confusion and doubt and we heard that last week the last word of psalm 88 being darkness the number of laments present in the book of psalms though i think indicates that god's people are to often approach him in worship amidst their suffering and confusion and pain And John Bloom, who's a staff writer with desiringgod.org, notes that the Holy Spirit inspired the psalmists, those who would write these praises and their and prayers, uh, to reflect a diverse range of painful experiences in order to teach us what acceptable worship looks like and sounds like in those moments. And lament psalms like Psalm 88 last week and Psalm 89 today give us valuable insights into the kind of worship that God calls us to even in our agony and our confusion. Psalm 89 is attributed to Ethan the Ezraite, 
who wrote during a time when the Israelites had been exiled by the Babylonians. And this was a dark period in Israel's history and marked by immense turmoil and anguish and questioning as it seemed that God wasn't upholding his covenant to bless the Davidic line of kings. There was no king from the line of David ruling over the people during this time, and it appeared that there never would be. The covenant that God made with David in 2 Samuel chapter 7 was a defining one for the people of Israel. And it's the theological context for this psalm. In 2 Samuel, God established David as king in Israel and promised him an everlasting throne over the people and a house built by the Lord that would preserve his royal line. And this covenant was a crucial part of Israel's self-identification. They were God's people. They were living in God's land under the rule of God's king who would lead them to experience God's blessing. However, now with Jerusalem destroyed and the people in exile and the kingdom seemingly shattered, the psalmist wonders if God truly keeps his promises. And so he laments. And in our own moments of confusion, when God's promises seem distant, Psalm 89 gives us an example of how we can approach God in worship and steward our faith in those moments through the giving of intentional praise and through the giving of faith-filled lament in prayer. And we do so on the basis of four great assurances of God's faithfulness. And I'd like to consider those four assurances of God's faithfulness as my headings uh, for my sermon as we work through the psalm. And the first one, looking at verses 1 to 18, is that God is faithful in his character. God is faithful in his character. Again, despite his circumstances, And before the psalmist lays out his complaint before God, he begins by offering praise, and specifically praise for God's faithfulness. He says in verse 1, I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. I will make known his faithfulness to all generations. And the example the psalmist is setting for us in these opening verses is that praise for God at times needs to be an act of our will. It's a spiritual discipline that we adopt. And the blessing that comes through the adoption of this discipline is realized through the necessary posture of humility that we must take in offering praise to God as we acknowledge our dependence on him for all things through our praise. As we proclaim his infallibility and his wisdom and the the beauty and perfection of his character, any prideful sense of self-autonomy has to crumble. And the circumstances of our lives are brought into proper perspective of God's endless faithfulness and the immutability of his character. Notice how the psalmist praises God in the first four verses. Just as God has established his faithfulness in the heavens, he has manifested his faithfulness on earth through his covenant with David. The source of the psalmist's confusion is also the source of his praise. And despite the current absence of a king from David's line on the throne, The act of praising God brings the psalmist to affirm his trust in God's constancy and draw comfort from the fact that God remains faithful in his character. And so from verses 5 to 18, the psalmist continues with this willful outpouring and offering of praise in the form of the hymn. And These words in particular were the uh, ideas that we sang this morning as we sang our own song of praise in Great is Thy Faithfulness. Verses 5 to 8, the heavens and angels praise God's unmatched faithfulness. Verses 9 to 13, God is praised for his dominion over every corner of the earth. Verses 14 to 18, God is praised for his righteousness, his justice, his protection, which along with his faithfulness form the foundation of his character. 
These three stanzas are a humble and willful offering of praise to God that people in every era, in every circumstance can give. And they model for us the proper posture that we are to take before God in our own moments of confusion and pain as we approach him with humility and extol his faithful character. Last week, Pastor Jude highlighted the benefit of singing corporate songs of lament when we gather, even if they don't reflect our current experience. When we join together in corporate worship and sing these songs, what we're doing is obeying the command of Colossians 3.16. That is to let the word of Christ dwell in us richly through the singing of songs and hymns and spiritual songs, and we admonish each other in all wisdom. Today, similarly, we might not always feel like singing songs of praise. At times, praise for God pours forth with ease. But at other times, given the circumstances of our lives and perhaps God's hard provinces, providences that we're living through, we might find it challenging to praise him. The example, though, set for us in Psalm 89 is that it is right and good to approach God in humility and at all times say, I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord. I will make known his faithfulness. Sacrificial praise that extols God's faithfulness and serves to remind us of what is absolutely true and certain of God's character is the theme that accompanies the believer's walk of faith. And this idea of self-denial and and walking by faith uh, is exemplified in the life of missionary Robert Thomas. Recently, my wife and I have been Uh, interested in exploring how the gospel has been passed down in our families from generation to generation. And in particular, we've become curious about how the gospel made its way to Korea. And recently, we were in a bookstore, and we came across uh, a small book called The Korean Pentecost, which talks about missionary efforts through the 1800s that did, in fact, bring the gospel to Korea. And in that book, we read of Thomas's story. And as the story goes, in 1865, Thomas, with a burden to share the gospel to the people of Korea, found a vessel that would help him navigate the rivers leading to the settlement of Pyongyang. And despite peaceful or the attempt at a peaceful interaction, the crew encountered resistance and there was a violent altercation that led to the ship being grounded. And during the chaos, witnesses reported this remarkable scene. Thomas emerged from the water, not carrying a weapon, but holding in his arms Bibles that he passed out to the people. And ultimately, he sacrificed his life that day to bring the word of God to the people of Korea. And he left an indelible mark on the nation Uh, The Pyongyang officials tried to confiscate the Bibles and destroy them, but many were concealed and later read in secret, and the seeds of the gospel were sown. And for us, our willful self-denial and walk of faith before God, it may not surface on a distant shore in quite so dramatic a fashion, but it will certainly emerge in the quiet of our prayer closets. And following the example of the psalmist, our application in those moments is to humble ourselves before God and willfully praise him for his faithful character and his unchanging nature, even as we grapple with his hard providences in our lives. Now, if you find it challenging, like I do sometimes, to articulate our prayers in those moments, let me encourage you to take up the practice of praying the words of Scripture back to God and allowing Scripture to shape your praise and your petitions. So as an example, if I were to pray using Psalm 89 as my, God, as my guide, it might sound something like this. Starting in verse 5, Father, your word declares that the heavens praise your wonders and faithfulness. And Father, in my confusion and uncertainty, grant me the strength to praise you as well. 
And in verse 8, your word says, Who is mighty as you are, O Lord, with your faithfulness all around you? Father, open my eyes to behold your might and your faithfulness. And help me to trust in you as my strength. And like verse 15 says, to be counted among those who are blessed, walking in the light of your presence. Brothers and sisters, God is faithful in his character. And so our call is to offer him humbly a willful offering of praise and pray his word back to him. God is faithful in his character. The second great assurance is that God is faithful to his covenant promises, looking at verses 19 to 37. In this section, the psalmist recounts the covenant God made with David, and he reminds God's of the word, God of the words that, that he spoke. He said, God would always sustain and strengthen the line of David. God would protect David from his enemies. Godly would, God would divinely exalt the throne of David. God would ensure that a Davidic king would be on the throne who would be the firstborn and the highest of the kings of the earth. And God would uphold his unfailing love toward David and keep his covenant with him. And God would preserve David's throne. And even if David's descendants turned away from the Lord and disobeyed his law, God would still keep his promise. Verse 34, the psalmist recalls that God said he would not betray his faithfulness or allow his promises to fail. And verse 35, he reminds God of the oath that was made. God said, I will not violate my covenant once for all. I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. God swore by his holiness that he would not lie to David. God's holiness is what sets him apart from all other beings and makes him completely unique. And for God to make an oath based on his holiness means the ramifications of that promise are so far reaching, they're beyond our comprehension. And just as God's holiness can never be altered or corrupted, so too his covenant with David would remain and be filled. But for the psalmist, given the limits of his knowledge of God's redemptive plan, this was a point of confusion because it appeared that God had abandoned his promise. Now for us, living in the light of the cross and the resurrection, we know how God ultimately fulfilled his covenant promise to David perfectly, completely, and eternally through Jesus Christ. And just as David was chosen and anointed by God, Jesus, God's anointed one, the Messiah sent to fulfill God's redemptive plan was given. Jesus is the one who would fulfill the promise of a Davidic king who would be the firstborn and highest of the kings of the earth. And just as God promised to punish the transgression of the people with the rod and their iniquity with stripes, 1 Peter 2 tells us that it was Jesus himself who bore our sins in his body on the tree. And in his sacrificial death, Jesus fulfilled the requirement for God's justice to be met while ensuring that God's steadfast love and faithfulness would go on unbroken. And just as God promised strength and authority to David, Jesus, God incarnate, triumphed through his death and resurrection and raised from the dead, now seated at the right hand of the Father, serving as the faithful witness to God's promises. The covenant that God made with David to establish his kingdom and bring blessing to all the nations finds its fulfillment in Jesus. God is faithful to his covenant promises. And in our moments, when it feels as if God's promises are slipping away, my encouragement to all of us is to open our Bibles and hear God speak to us through his word and through the illuminating ministry of the Holy Spirit, receive the affirmation that, yes, God's promise to David found its ultimate fulfillment in Jesus. And we might turn to Ephesians 1, which says that we have been blessed in Christ with every spiritual blessing. And as believers, we are those who have been adopted 
by God into his family. We are those who have received redemption through the blood of Christ. We are those who have had God's forgiveness lavished upon us according to the riches of his grace. And we are those who have received an eternal inheritance and have been sealed with his Holy Spirit as a guarantee of the inheritance. We are those who have received the benefits of this glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. And God's faithfulness and steadfast love made known to us in Christ is the foundation of our hope, is the foundation of our lives in all circumstances. And as believers, we need to constantly remind ourselves of the gospel truths of Scripture. And so Psalm 89 leads us to resolve to be gospel-centered people in all circumstances. People may have religion-centered lives. They may have benevolence-centered lives. They may have activity-centered lives. Some people may even claim to have a spiritual life of some sort. But if they have not bowed their knee to the lordship of Jesus Christ in repentance and faith, that spirituality, that benevolence, that activity will lead to destruction. Only the life that rests in faith on the substitutionary atoning death of Jesus can truly experience the freedom and blessing that comes in reconciliation with God. Because it's only through Jesus Christ and his gospel that we enter into relationship with God and fully receive the benefits of his steadfast love and faithfulness. For those here or listening who have not bowed their knee to Jesus as Lord and Savior, the only remedy for your sin and despair is the gospel. Repent from your sin. Call on Jesus to save you and receive him by faith. And believers, when our hearts are tempted to despair, the only remedy is the gospel. And so as a church, let's do well to remind each other of that as often as we can, when we gather for corporate worship, when we get together in our life groups, when uh, the, the men's uh, ministry meets, when the women's ministry meets, the youth and young adults, let's do well to remind each other of the gospel and seize every opportunity to remind ourselves that God has lavished his love on us through his sons. Brothers and sisters, when you're tempted to despair, remember Jesus and rehearse the gospel. God is faithful in his character. God's faithfulness to his covenant with David has been realized perfectly in Jesus. The third great assurance is that we can trust in God's faithfulness. We can trust in God's faithfulness. Verses 38 to 45 illustrate this for us. As here the psalmist brings his complaint before God in prayer. And notice the sudden and dramatic change of tone that marks the beginning of this section. The first three words signal this shift. But now you. But now you have cast off and rejected. The transition is Jarring. It's like a beginner driver learning how to drive stick shift and trying to change gears without using the clutch. And the psalmist begins to express his frustration in a very direct way to God. And notice also the pronoun you throughout this section that makes God the subject of nearly every sentence. You have renounced the covenant. You have defiled. You have breached. You have cut short. You have covered him with shame. We get to the sila at the end and we breathe a sigh of relief as it lets us pause and reflect on the weight of this prayer. And we might wonder, is it right to speak to God in this manner? Well, given the example of Psalm 89, I think the answer is a cautious yes. If, by virtue of the shed blood of Christ, we come humbly before God in faith, we have the assurance that God welcomes us to enter into his presence boldly and pray intercessory prayers that honestly lay out our complaints before him. Notice that the psalmist is careful not to accuse God of wrongdoing. 
He's not rebelling against God. He's not shaking his fist at God in anger, but rather he is presenting his complaint as an intercession on behalf of the people of Israel. And doing so in faith, he's calling on God to fulfill his promises. And this type of prayer is another example of how we might steward our faith in moments when God's faithfulness and promises feel distant. We don't reject God, nor do we adopt a a false sense of optimism that denies our feelings and the complexities of our situation. Psalm 89 teaches us to offer a faith-filled complaint in prayer, trusting God's steadfast love and faithfulness. The great preacher Charles Spurgeon instructed his congregation to do the same. On these verses, he said this, God's actions may appear to us to be the reverse of his promises, and so our best course is to come before him in prayer. We are allowed to do this, for the psalmist did so unrebuked, but we must do it humbly and in faith. The Bible often refers to faithless complaining as grumbling before God, and grumbling before God is a sin. Faithless complaining, grumbling is sinful because it accuses God of wrongdoing. But the faith-filled complaint doesn't impugn God of wrongdoing. Rather, it's an honest, groaning expression of what it's like to experience the trouble and anguish and grief of life in this sinful, fallen world. And the example of Psalm 89 shows that God welcomes this kind of faith-filled complaining as we humbly come to him by the blood of his son and ask for his help. And the posture of humility that accompanies praise is now joined with the act of faith that confidently approaches God in prayer. Mark Vrogop, in his book called Dark Clouds and Deep Mercy, a book that's been commended to us over the course of our study through the Psalms, again, is helpful because he offers some practical steps on how to lay our complaints before God in humility and faith. He suggests this, that we approach God with a humble heart. Bring your pain, not your pride. He says, use the language of the Psalms and other biblical texts to frame your complaints. In other words, pray the Bible. He says, openly share your pain, your fears and frustrations with God, knowing he understands and is not surprised by your struggles. We don't need to have an outright rejection of God in anger, nor adopt an inauthentic expression of optimism. God welcomes us to approach him in our pain and groaning. And Vrogop says, use complaint as a step toward deeper lament and seeking God's help rather than seeing it as an end in itself. And that's what we see In the final section of Psalm 89, as the psalmist moves to offer a formal prayer of lament. And we'll look at verses 46 to 52 in the final section. And the final great assurance of God's faithfulness here is a reminder that God's faithfulness will not cease. As we've learned through our study of the Psalms, God has gifted his people with invitations to pray prayers of lament as a means of grace to help us commune with him in those moments where his promises seem distant. And prayers of lament help us to pray in our pain and offer acceptable worship in our suffering. And it's the testimony of many who have taken up this practice that God uses these prayers to bring comfort and to bring peace to our hearts. It's a good thing to pray prayers of lament. And so it's no surprise that starting in verse 46, we encounter a formal prayer of lament that follows the familiar structure that we've become accustomed to looking for with the psalmist beginning by turning to God with the words, How long, O Lord? And then following the turn to God, the psalmist briefly lays out his complaint. He's already laid it out in full in the previous section, 
But now he prays his complaint using rhetorical questions like, will you hide yourself forever? And Lord, where is your steadfast love of old? And at the same time, the psalmist makes his requests known to God and asks God to remember how short his time is and to remember how his servants are mocked and he's longing for himself and the people of Israel to once again experience the joy of God's steadfast love and faithfulness. And this longing is at the heart of most of our cries of lament that in the midst of our painful circumstances and confusion, we would experience the intimacy of communion with God and the joy of the experiential knowledge of his steadfast love and his faithfulness. And so we cry out, how long, O Lord? This painful cry is in fact a cry of faith. It's a cry of faith that turns to God knowing that he is the only one who could ever possibly answer that question. It's a cry that turns to God trusting that his faithfulness will not cease. And perhaps you're familiar with this cry of how long, O Lord, when you pray for what seems right and good according to God's will and the answer seems far off, we cry out, how long, O Lord? when we pray for the salvation of a loved one and they've yet to repent, we cry out, how long, O Lord? When we pray for the healing of someone who is sick and they've yet to be healed, we cry out, how long, O Lord? Will it be forever? Well, there's comfort and encouragement for us today to gain from the psalm. And the comfort comes from knowing how God, in fact, answered the psalmist's question of how long. If we were to go back in time while Ethan were writing this psalm, we might say to him, wait, Ethan, there's more to come. In a few hundred years, a baby will be born in Bethlehem from the line of David. And the angels will announce that he is Christ the Lord And as God incarnate, he will fulfill all of the promises of God's covenant with David, and he'll take upon himself the punishment that our sins deserve for breaking God's law. He'll die on a cross. He'll rise again. He'll be seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven. Jesus Christ, the son of David, to rule on an eternal throne established by God. And because of this, we can come to Jesus in our sin, in our brokenness, And through repentance and faith in him, receive forgiveness and have the joy of our communion with God restored and experience God's steadfast love and faithfulness. We'd say, Ethan, just wait. God's faithfulness, it it will never cease. Look ahead. Take a long view of your circumstance. God's faithfulness will be seen in its perfect fulfillment and fullness. So in the same way, when we lament, we need to remember the same thing. And I would encourage us to look to Hebrews 12, verse 1, which says that believers are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses who have gone before us. And if we could hear them, they'd be saying to us, just wait. In your cry of lament, just wait. Look ahead, there's more to come. Lay aside every weight and sin and run with endurance the race set before you. Turn your eyes to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who is seated at the right hand of God, the Father. And when he returns visibly, the answer to our question of how long, O Lord, will be answered fully and perfectly and completely. So take a long, eternal view of life and draw strength and comfort now in the grace that God gives to sustain his people and help them persevere. This is the grace that Paul reminded Titus of in chapter 2, where those who have received God's saving grace are also trained by that grace to persevere in faith and godliness. And at the same time, God's grace that saves us and trains us to live as his children in this world is the same grace that sustains us in our lamenting moments as we wait for the blessed hope that the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
It's God's grace that sustains us in our waiting. It's God's grace that helps us to live with an eternal view and a long-sighted hope while we trust that God is working together all things for the good of those who love him. And while we await the fulfillment of God's promises, what do we do? Well, we can pray prayers of lament in our sorrow and in our confusion But as we do, we need to remind ourselves of God's faithful character and we need to sing his praises and the praises of his steadfast love. And we need to remind ourselves of God's promises of salvation and we need to rehearse the gospel daily. And we pray in faith, trusting in God's faithfulness and know that we will experience his grace to help us live with an eternal perspective, looking ahead to the return of Jesus when the answer to our question, how long, will be answered fully. Psalm 89 concludes with one final verse. And many scholars believe that the psalmist's thought, Ethan's thoughts, ended at verse 51, and that verse 52 was later added under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit by a scribe and as an editorial mark to end uh, this major section, the third book of the Psalms. The verse says, Blessed be the Lord forever. Amen and amen. And if you look, a similar ending marks the conclusion of the other major sections of the Psalms. Regardless, this doxology serves uh, two functions. It does signal the end of this third book of the Psalms, but it's also the concluding part of the prayer of lament. It's an expression of trust in God. And it wraps up all that has come before. And the statement declares that no matter how much we suffer or are perplexed by our circumstance, we will say by faith, blessed be the Lord forever. Amen and amen. And so just as the psalm started with a willful offering of praise, it ends in the same way, reminding us that God is worthy of praise and that his faithfulness will not cease even when his promises seem distant. And although all the questions we have are yet to be answered, we are given these four great assurances of God's faithfulness. God is faithful in his character. God is faithful to his covenant promises. We can trust in God's faithfulness, and God's faithfulness will not cease. So we say with the psalmist, blessed be the Lord forever. Amen and amen. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for the words of Psalm 89 and that it leads us to recognize the glory and grandeur of your faithfulness and of your steadfast love that endures forever. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters here who have hurting hearts, who are in the midst of confusing circumstances. Would you bring comfort and assurance by your spirit? Lord, as we reflect on the words of scripture. Lord, lift their hearts that they would be able to turn to you in faith and say, blessed be the Lord forever. Amen and amen. Father, help us to acknowledge in all circumstances your perfect wisdom, your righteousness, and your justice. Help us to offer willful prayers and songs of praise. Lord, as we remember your promises and how you've perfectly fulfilled your covenant with David through your son, Jesus. And Lord, as we take up the faith-filled prayer of lament and bring our complaint and intercessions before you, help us to trust in you and to pray with humility and faith. And I pray that we would rest on your grace that trains us and sustains us in our walk of faith. Father, I thank you. And I pray that you would help us again to turn to you and fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who is unchanging, Lord, and the fulfiller of all of our needs. Father, I pray this in your name. Amen. Well, we can come before the Father and pray our prayers of lament with humble hearts, as Barry said, because of what Christ has done. And so 
I want to close our time here singing of the advocate that we have in Christ that allows us to come before the throne of the Father. So as you are able, please stand and we'll sing. Amen. Our benediction today comes from Psalm 89. It's responsive, and the congregation's response will be on the screen. The covenant God established with David, confirmed by his holiness through an oath, has been perfectly fulfilled in Jesus Christ. God has not forsaken us, nor abandoned us. Instead, he poured out the wrath our sins deserved upon his Son. And so as you go, set your hope on the glorious return of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, who having died as our substitute, 
triumphed through his resurrection and now sits at the right hand of the Father, he alone holds the answer to our lamenting cry, How long, O Lord? Praise God from whom.